Hello everyone, welcome to his author's voice and I am the author Jack Sanger. I thought as a digression from readings from my various novels and short stories I'd try to entertain you with a kind of discursive account of a pattern that has pervaded my life. It's kind of imperceptible, but there have been distinct moments when it's come to the fore and commanded my attention. I'm calling it, I could have been a shaman. first question I ask myself is, is a shaman born a shaman or does some kind of nourishment within life develop that capacity within him or her? So I look back at my life and say, maybe I come from a line of shaman or maybe there's something in my immediate prehistory, which suggests that shamanism may be part of my armory, so to speak. So the first little story I'm going to tell you is before I was born. Um, I had a sister, and she was born terrified of water. My parents were in India, my father was in the military. And my sister Margaret, at the age of 18 months, was out on the lawns in front of the veranda where all the white folk were sitting, no doubt, and started screaming and pointing to a fountain. They rushed out and found a child drowning and saved it. Now, how an 18-month-old would know that is beyond some kind of capacity for comprehension. But anyway, she also was terrified of water. She couldn't be bathed very easily. She went blue and rigid. My father took her to a swimming pool. I mean, he was a captain in the PE course, so he knew all about physical activity. But he couldn't get her to swim because, again, she went blue and rigid and was terrified of the water. Now, when she was six years old, she was found drowned in a water tank in the garden. She had a rail round it. Now, the curious thing about this was that I didn't discover for until I was in my 40s when I was in India with my father, taking him there for his last great hurrah, that when they did the autopsy on Margaret, there was no water in her lungs. Even though the autopsy, it said, found drowned. So something remarkably mysterious about little Margaret's life and her precognition of her death. So, was what was in Margaret's genes in my genes as well? The first uh, memory I have of dreams becoming reality was when I was about six or seven years old. And I dreamt that I, when I was coming home from school, from primary school, which involved running, climbing over a wall and running down a long meadow and crossing a stream, which in the northeast of England is called a beck, and making my way up through the back of the garden to the house. But on my way, in my dream, I saw I came to a hedge by the brook, and in it was perfectly formed 
kind of conical bird's nest with two eggs in it, little blue eggs. So the next day, coming home from school, of course, the, the dream fresh in my mind, or I suppose broken by me walking or running down the, the meadow, I went straight to the hedge, saw the nest, and there were the two little blue eggs. So that's my first kind of otherworldly experience, such as it was. Somewhat later in life, when I became a student and had very few resources, and but I had a flat that had to be paid for, um, there were objects I needed, there were books I needed for courses I was taking. There were objects for the house where I lived. And I found that somehow, if it came to me that I needed these things, I would just go off to a charity shop and almost inevitably there would be the book, there would be the object. A kind of wish fulfillment really. But it's difficult to explain. It wasn't as though I could focus and say, I am now going into this shop and I am going to get this object. It was a more it was more subtle than that. It was I'd had at the back of my mind these various needs and they only came to the fore when I was passing a charity shop and I suddenly dived in as though I was being lured into the charity shop by the book or the object. Even later in life I was in the Highlands and something prompted me to go and see a gypsy for a fortune telling and there was a beautiful caravan all cut glass and steel shiny like some object dropped out of the sky in 2001 and there was an old lady and her daughter there and the old lady saw me approach and I, I actually witnessed her do this and she sent the daughter away and invited me in and I crossed her palm with silver and she did a bit of a fortune telling which actually was remarkable but that's not the purpose of this account but she did say to me you don't really need people like me everything you have is inside you Everything you need is inside you. All the powers are inside you. That kind of thing. So I came out a little bit bemused and quite elated, really. Later again, uh, I, became, I became interested in tarot and in reading tarot and so on. Not really for fortune-telling. Not to understand the future, but more to gain a better purchase on the present and open up some kind of conduit between my conscious self and my un unconscious self. And I find the tarot remarkable for that kind of meditation. Anyway, what, pr what prompted me to, to do this particular po podcast was that a friend on her Facebook uh, showed a picture of uh, a flyer for something called Barsham Fair and I did tarot readings and generally as part of the entertainment put on for the punters of which there were thousands I might say. Anyway I, had, I did have cues to the tent where I sat cross-legged on a Persian carpet a big floppy hat and a cape and I did readings but I did readings in a different sort of way it wasn't just me talking 
I would kind of draw the person in and get them to articulate, rather as I did when I was doing tarot solo, get them to articulate what they felt about themselves and life and so on. But inevitably, uh, current problems and future possibilities and solutions did come out in those. And gradually, I, I began to be sought out by people who'd had readings. And so much so that I, when they were saying things like, everything came out just as you said it would, I thought, I better stop this. I'm, I'm leading the witness, my lad. But they got very angry when I wouldn't read further. Uh, because they felt that somehow they were beginning to rely upon the readings as a guide to their destiny. More recently, and I put it on Facebook and so on, I had uh, a really interesting experience. It was, it was the night before my birthday, which happened, and the birthday was on the Sunday, and I was here in France. And I had a dream, rather like my bird's egg dream, and in this dream, I went to car boot sale, which here is called a vie de grenier. And in my dream, I walked around and I found this loot. And it was beautiful. And the guy who was uh, selling it uh, said he wanted 200 euros for it. I said, well, that's far too much. And I walked around and came back to him just as he was selling it to somebody else for 100 euros. As you imagine, I was a bit uh, pissed off by this. But anyway, um, when I woke up, I told, I told my wife about it. I said, it's a big granny. I'm going to go and see whether the loot's there. And I have it on my wall here. I walked round exactly to the same spot and there was the man, though a bit younger than uh, in my dream. And there was the loot and I said, how much do you want for it? And he said, 60 euros. I said, well, what about 50? He said, done. And so I became the proud owner of not a loot, but an African loot called a Cora. Now, I'm just telling these little stories because throughout my life I felt that if I really pushed some kind of button um, and allowed the unconscious to, to reign, then it would transform my current situation. I found it extraordinarily true in writing. When I wrote Azimuth, which um, is on my website, and it's a thousand pages long, when I wrote Azimuth, I was completely unaware at times of what I'd written until I read it later. I was in a kind of... They talk about being in a kind of purple vein, but it was... Or Jimi Hendrix, maybe a purple haze. And... It was extraordinary. And some of the things I wrote, I had to check later because I had no idea whether that kind of background detail had any veracity at all. And I found that it did. So what I was plugging into, I have no idea. I think the Jungian universal unconscious is the best explanation for it. So I'm going to end there. I know it's a bit of a kind of wandering tale but uh, I'd say at the end of all this that it's something that can't be um, turned on and off it's like in the dark you can only see through peripheral vision if you stare at something you don't see anything but somehow you can gather what it is out of the corner of your eyes and when you're attempting to make communication with your deep inner self, whatever that is, it's the same. You have to somehow, as in curling, you have to clean the ice to allow the curling iron to go where it goes. And 
I've been very fortunate in my life because it's happened. It's happened over and over again. So I suspect shamanism is a bit like that. Uh, for some of us, it's much stronger than others. And people like myself, it's a bit there and a bit uncontactable when I would really want it. But as a background element to my life, it's been very rich and very supportive of me. So, there we are. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to conclude this podcast by, again, referring to my website, www.jacksanger.com so that you can check out some of my experiences as a writer as I drop into that purple vein. That's all for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>